Organisms do things is a pretty uncontroversial statement, but organisms want to do things is a whole lot more controversial. Do plants really want to grow? Do our hearts aim to pump blood around our body? Do our cells know how to divide? Using intentional language like this seems to only be useful as a metaphor. Of course our cells don't want to do anything. They're just a bundle of chemistry. They don't have brains. That said, when you watch a video like this of a white blood cell chasing a bacterium, you can't help but think that its goal is to catch it. The question of whether the language of goals, knowing, wanting and trying belong in science or not is the question of a 2000 year old debate in biology. And in this series of videos, I hope to convince you that such language is more than just a useful metaphor. Taking it seriously could be the change in perspective we need to fight cancer, develop a new theory of evolution, and unlock the secrets of how our brains work. 2000 years ago, the language of purposes was at the heart of biology. It was how we respected the richness, complexity, and unpredictability of the natural world. We looked at it the way we look at a rainforest. We were astounded by its beauty and deeply unsure if we would ever be able to understand it. But somewhere along the way, we replaced this thriving world with a dead one. We took all the life out of it and looked at it like a machine. It was reducible to its parts. It ticked away like clockwork, dictated by natural laws, and it was devoid of all purpose. So how did we get here? How did we lose sight of the rainforest universe? How did the machine metaphor infect biology? Around 350 BC, Aristotle wrote his treatise De Anima, a comprehensive account of the biological soul. This soul, or anima in Latin, was nothing like the Christian concept of the soul that exists today. It wasn't a physical thing, nor could it be separated from the body it was located in. Rather, Aristotle described the anima as the collection of active abilities possessed by the organism. So for instance, a plant's anima is made up of its ability to grow and reproduce, but a human's anima is more complex since it also includes our ability to think and reason. This way of thinking about life is called teleology, and it's the idea that organisms have goals or purposes. They're not just the product of atoms bumping together. They actually strive to do things. They're alive. To our modern ears, talk of trees wanting to grow upwards sounds pretty foreign, and it would be easy to dismiss it as nonsense. But let's entertain the idea for a second. You have to remember that this is a time before modern science or Christianity. So without the anima, the Greeks would have to explain how a tree manages to produce apples so consistently, purely in terms of the random movement of atoms. Quite rightly, Aristotle says that this just seems way too improbable. Clearly the coordination of our body parts or a tree's form is hardly accidental. And Aristotle argues that to explain these regularities, we have to look to the organism's goals. We have a mouth because we have to eat, and a tree grows apples because it needs to reproduce. As Dennis Walsh puts it, for Aristotle, way of life explains the arrangement of parts, not the other way around. This goal-driven way of looking at organisms was certainly useful, and it gave many Arab and European thinkers the tools for understanding the regularities of life for over 2000 years. But in the 17th century, a very different perspective of the world was beginning to gain ground. René Descartes is a French philosopher living in the Netherlands. In 1618, while on military duty in Breda, Descartes meets the craftsman Isaac Beekman, who introduces him to some revolutionary ideas. Whilst Descartes' scholastic education in France was dominated by Aristotle's philosophy, here in the Netherlands with Beekman, Descartes is free to theorise as he pleases and be as creative as he wants to. And so together with Beekman, he begins to formulate what will become known as the mechanical view of the universe. This is the idea that the world is no more than a clock, so to understand it, we have to take it apart into its smaller pieces. And once we do that, we find that the pieces don't have any self-organizing goals like Aristotle suggests. They're just physical matter ticking away. From this central metaphor, Descartes believes that we can study the world in the same way that we study clocks. That is, by looking at how matter moves according to set laws. We don't need any more than that. No anima required. So for Descartes, the universe was dead. There were no internal goals, no wanting, no striving, and no thinking. Actually, he makes an exception for us humans. That's his famous, I think therefore I am. But the rest of the universe was dead. Animals were just machines. All of their behavior could be understood by simple matter in motion. Therefore, we shouldn't feel guilty for killing them or cutting them open alive, as this is just the same as taking apart a clock. Animals for Descartes were not really alive. 
But how then to answer the question that puzzled Aristotle? If everything is just dead matter in motion, then why are living things so well organised? Descartes attempted to give some preliminary mechanical explanations to account for how animals manage to breathe and circulate blood. But it still left the question of why these mechanisms existed in the first place. William Paley would give the clearest answer to this question two centuries later in his magnum opus Natural Theology. He extended Descartes' watch metaphor to say that if the world and everything in it operated like clockwork, then there must have been a watchmaker to put it all together. That watchmaker being God. So why do animals have lungs to breathe in oxygen and hearts to pump blood? Well, because God designed them to be that way. The nature of this answer is actually pretty teleological. It gives a purposeful explanation for why things are the way that they are. But here the whys are externally imposed onto the organism, not internally generated by an anima as Aristotle had imagined it. The universe was still a machine, it just happened to be God's machine. So although our digestive system follows certain mechanistic laws based on our physiology, the reason it's so perfectly designed is because God created it for us. There's no need for an internal soul to do all the organising when God has designed everything already. The mechanisms explain the how, and God explains the why. Paley's argument is pretty controversial today because of its association with the intelligent design movement. That said, in 1986, Richard Dawkins showed how the watchmaker analogy had actually survived into modern biology, but instead of a purposeful, conscious designer, we had a blind watchmaker, natural selection. So when biologists today stumble across some beautiful adaptation in nature, like the streamlined body of a fish, they're less likely to say, wow, look at what God has made, and instead opt for, it's crazy. I love natural selection. In taking the place of God the designer, natural selection gives biologists a way to talk about purposes, functions, and other teleological ideas in the natural world. We really can say that cactuses have spines for the purpose of deterring herbivores. Because this is just shorthand for, in an environment with lots of cactus eating herbivores, cactuses with spines tended to get eaten less and were favoured by natural selection to survive and reproduce. Yeah, that's a mouthful and is why the shorthand is so common. But we're still a long ways off from what the Aristotelian universe looked like. The cactus is still not really alive. It's not an active player in control of its own fate. It's just an object formed by natural selection. The universe is still dead. Many people are entirely happy with this view of the universe. For instance, Nobel Prize winning biologist François Jacob celebrated the fact that we no longer study life in our laboratories. But this quip ignores the problems of the machine worldview. If we simply think of organisms like machines and reduce them to their genetic parts, we can seriously oversimplify the world. We can begin to think that race, behaviour and sexuality are all just a product of our genes, that we're just computers programmed by our genetic code, that evolution is just the changing of gene frequencies, that the whole organism can be deduced from just its molecular parts. None of these things are true. The genetic approach is a useful map for navigating some of the biological world, but it's become so widespread that the map has become the world. This isn't a new realisation. There was immediate resistance to Descartes' machine metaphor, with many biologists insisting that organisms were more than machines. There was one problem in particular that seemed to defy mechanistic explanations. It was the question of how organisms could develop from relatively simple forms to immensely complex ones. It almost seemed like magic. Nothing else in the universe seemed to behave the way life did here. I mean, if I plant a rock in some soil, it doesn't just turn into a full organism. Clearly something special was going on. The solution was to posit that there was some kind of mysterious force directing the chemicals inside living things around, causing them to become more complex. This force went by many different names over the years, but they all fell under the umbrella term vitalism. Vitalism was a very different philosophy to Descartes, because vitalists saw the biological world as being directed by non-physical forces. But their belief in these forces wasn't based on mere speculation or religious convictions. They were grounded in concrete empirical observation. In 1891, a 24-year-old German embryologist, Hans Driesch, was working in Naples on sea urchins. One day, Driesch takes a 16-cell sea urchin embryo and cuts it in half. Taking the mechanical philosophy seriously, if the embryo contains the complete information needed to make an organism, then each of these halves should only contain enough information to make half an organism. Makes pretty good logical sense. But to his surprise, each of these halves managed to develop into whole sea urchin larvae. 
This was a very unexpected result and seemed to defy the mechanistic view. You can't split a machine into its parts and watch them turn back into whole machines again. For the next seven years, Trish carried out experiment after experiment to work out what was going on here. But by the early 1900s, he didn't think that there would be a mechanistic solution to the problem. He claimed that there must be a kind of vital force guiding the sea urchin embryos to organise themselves. The vitalists never managed to provide conclusive evidence for their vital forces, and eventually vitalism would be abandoned for being too unscientific. But Ernst Meyer rightly points out that it would be ahistorical to ridicule vitalists. When one reads the writings of one of the leading vitalists like Driesch, one is forced to agree with him that many of the basic problems of biology simply cannot be solved by a philosophy as that of Descartes, in which the organism is simply considered a machine. The logic of the critique of the vitalists was impeccable. In fact, in the early 20th century, a small group of biologists known as the organicists took on the spirit of vitalism without its extra metaphysical baggage. They argued that most biological phenomena arose out of the reciprocal interactions between different parts and levels of the organism. So instead of a linear reduction to atoms, organisms ought to be studied as complex wholes, completely irreducible to their molecular parts. More importantly, to understand why the parts do what they do, we have to look to the goals of the whole organism, a very Aristotelian idea. And with that, the organicists brought goal-seeking back into biology without having to invent mystical vital forces. The organicist movement has been all but forgotten by modern biologists, but by re-examining their approach, we can see two paths forward for biology. We can continue along the path set out by Descartes in viewing organisms as machines, or we can jump back onto the one envisaged long ago by Aristotle, which views organisms as agents that pursue goals. What does this second perspective give us? Does it really make any sense to talk about non-conscious organisms having goals? And what's so bad about looking at the world like a machine anyway? Those are all very good questions, which I'll eventually answer in future videos. But in the meantime, I'll let you discuss them in the comments below. And if you're interested in learning more, make sure you like and subscribe, and I'll catch you in the next one.